All right, y'all. Hi, this is Albert. Um, pronouns he, him, his. And we're back with another video for um, my reading list, which today we're going to be talking about white Negroes and, and when cornrows were in vogue and other thoughts on cultural appropriation by Lauren Michelle Jackson. So this is... Um, a book that I just pretty much learned about. I haven't heard of Nor Lauren Michelle Jackson um, until this year, actually. So she's um, a professor at, um, I think, um, is, she's a professor at um, Northwestern University. She teaches at the English and African American Studies. So it's another um, academic. Um, but she's also a journalist. She wrote for essence um new republic um teen vogue and other magazines and articles so she's a very um profound and notable writer and um this is um pretty much a book that talks about um cultural appropriation which we all know is um an interesting topic to talk about because it's like when is there a line between appropriation and appreciation and like and um is it ever possible to go into um something without appropriating it and um jackson went into um what can we really do to navigate um being in a society where there's so many different groups there's so many different cultures and where where can we get to um a place where we respect each other so um this is um pretty much her um um it's a collection it's it's not a collection of essays it's a book but i know she wrote essays and articles about these but um yeah so we can go on with with this and um she starts off um talking about the definition of appropriation which is pretty much taking using something and putting it into something else for different purposes so like that can be money like there's appropriations bill and government and stuff like that like the like you put a something from a different budget and put it into a different budget for a different purpose so that's appropriating in a way and um she yeah she, and um so looking it into um a cultural aspect it's um pretty different because it's pretty much using um a culture from a group and using it for your benefit for your benefit and um you can make some money off of that there's a cultural it's a cultural capitalism that she um pretty much says um how cultural appropriation is to a point where it's um very disrespectful and exploitative and um she pretty much talked about like appropriation is pretty much an American way of life now because it's pretty much the history of the United States to steal something and benefit off of it. So she was talking about um, music in particular. Like she said that Langston Hughes, um, she quoted Langston Hughes saying, you've taken my blues and gone. And talking about, like she has a chapter about black music, but you know, black music like black people you pretty much originated um the country rock blues um all sorts of music but it it got the music got to a point where it got mainstream and the face of those music tends to be white people so for example Elvis Presley who is considered the king of rock and roll when Rosetta Tharp was pretty much making rock and roll music um it was pretty pretty known back then too but then elvis came along and you know how whiteness is pretty much prioritized to um, make these markets um bang um it's um he became the face of rock and roll so um that's pretty that's pretty much um something that you really it's really hard to escape because because we're in a society where different people are in a bit are in these um industries and then 
you make they they do something to make more profit and more um, mainstream, and it has to be someone who's white, probably someone who's cis, um, heterosexual um, man, and all these different things that generate the power to make the revenue that these these businesses want to make. And um, she talked about the different the difference between like appropriation and appreciation is the power dynamics um and the, and who's actually benefiting from it so um it's yeah she said um national dialogue on appropriation extends beyond the boundaries of popular music from halloween costumes to single day mayo parties to the washington redskins who are now known as the washington football team to decorative bendies and other music festival fashion, the new millennium and an avowedly more conscious generation of people is tasked with taking seriously all kinds of cultural masquerade. So, and, and now cultural appropriation is now, it's, it's like being understood now more compared to like probably 10 years ago. Like it's, it's being more understood now, but in the mainstream sense, but like people had to go into um, their own um, critical thinking to make these to make these call outs, and um, she said something about how cult, how appropriation is pretty much tied to capitalism. Um, she said when the powerful appropriate from the oppressed. Society's imbalances are exacerbated and inequalities prolonged. In America, white people hoard power like hungry, hungry hippos. One cannot understand American capitalism either historically or in its current configuration, says political scientist Michael Dawson, without understanding the profound role that the racial order has had in shaping capitalism in the United States. Key institutions such as markets and the state itself. In the history of problematic appropriation in America, we could start with the land and crops and cuisine commanded from native peoples along with the mass expropriation of the labor of the enslaved. So going back into the founding of the United States, appropriation is pretty much part of American culture. Stealing cultures from other cultures is pretty much American culture. And... um, Yes, she said the tradition lives on. The things black people make with their hands and minds for pay and for the hell of it are exploited by companies and individuals who offer next to nothing in return. When people are not penalized for flaunting black culture, they are rewarded for doing so financially, artistically, socially, and intellectually. For a white person, seeing, seeing, citing, and compensating black people, however, has no such reward and may actually prove risky. After all, says another eminent critic, the cultural theorist Lauren Berlant, the American dream does not allow a lot of time for curiosity about people. It is not convenient or productive to have curiosity about. So the the corporations they don't they don't care about the experiences of people. It all depends on what makes it um, profitable for the mainstream, and that's pretty much them <laughs> they're the mainstream they're the ones that control the narratives they're the one that controls the media they're the one that controls the government they make the they they make the narrative on how they want people to know about things and um um jackson came up with the um had st- statistics um about um the racial wealth gap um, she said black households with a college educated breadwinner hold less wealth than white families whose breadwinners do not have a high school diploma. So think about it. A person who has a co- who has a college degree is a bread is the breadwinner, but white breadwinners who do not even have a high school diploma make more than black households with a college education. And also said white households with unemployed breadwinners have a higher net worth than black households whose breadwinners work full time. And that can be because of generational wealth. And that can also be because of um, how how there's more care to whiteness because of these housing and job markets. And um, another and another statistic is controlled for income. Black families save at a higher rate than their white counterparts and spend less than whites. 
So it's so according to reports, black people are most likely to save their money because they they know that that's pretty much their lifeline sometimes. And um, the next one is white single parent households have over double the net worth of two parent black households and single white women with children possess wealth equal to single black women without children. And that depends on how many children, too. <laughs> so um, it tells you about like like the these mythologically like black people can't save money when in fact it the reports show that black people are most likely to um save and spend money um carefully and responsibly because of the situations that racism um puts on puts on them and and uh, went to college, got married, started a business. Like, even if you go to college, white people are still going to make more than you, even if they don't have a high school diploma. And um, starting a business, like, it depends on how the banks will 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 um will um accept your um accept the business reports and stuff like that. And um, yeah, she pretty much went into the racial wealth gap. And finally, she said this, everybody wants the insurgence of blackness with the wealth of whiteness. That's cultural appropriation pretty much so explained there. Like they want the coolness that, and they like to play with blackness, but they don't want the circumstances that come with being black, whether that's um, so coming to more violence, whether that's police violence, um, financial violence, sexual violence, and many other um, things that cause oppression. And Jackson also stated, um, everybody wants to be cool without fearing for their lives. They want blackness only as a suggestion, they want to remain non-black, keep centuries of subjection and violence at bay with the prefix non firmly in place. When appropriative gestures flow to the powerful amnesia follows when culture is embraced and its people discarded it's too easy to trick the country into believing somebody white started it all nor does the american dream offer incentive to investigate the possibility that it might be otherwise so pretty much go into the contradiction of the american dream and how it comes at the expense of someone's nightmare all right, so now that's over with the introduction. So we're gonna start off with um, there's um, there are parts two in this book. So we'll probably do part one and part two for this video. So part one is titled "Sound and Body." So mm, chapter one is titled "The Pop Star Swinging and Singing," and chapter two is "The Cover Girl Blackness Groundbreaking." So that's part one. Chapter one and two are part of part one. So chapter one, um, the pop star singing and swinging. So I know it's pretty much notable about how Miley Cyrus um, pretty much is, an, is a very fairly recent um, example of cultural appropriation, how she used hip hop. And um, it's, she's not the first one that actually did that. But um, Jackson went into um, Christina Aguilera. Um, if if y'all know, um, she had this album um called Stripped, um, and y'all know about Chris. You follow if you follow Christina Aguilera's career, she was the Mickey Mouse um club um kid, and she started off with um, um pretty much um R and B and stuff like that. She like she already she always been doing like R and B um soul and influence pop like she's a pop artist but she but the influences she's in the upbringing she had were like r&b soul and all that stuff such as etta james um aretha franklin um dinah washington ella fitzgerald and um other notable black artists so because if y'all y'all heard um christina's voice she it has like a soulful tone to it like it it makes you recall a lot of those figures and um, when she got to um, her album Stripped, that's when she kind of got more sexually provocative. So similar to Miley Cyrus. And um, um, she was talking of, 
she she pretty much critiqued um um Aguilera um use um that her era there and there where there's songs called Dirty um Can't Hold Us Down and um I haven't seen the music video for Can't Hold Us Down in a while but I saw it now after reading this book so if y'all saw the the music video for Can't Hold Us Down so it's in a urban it's in uh what is considered the ghetto and um there's there's black there's black people and um it had um the sl and there's graffiti um with crack is whack so you think i'm thinking about the war on drugs and then um christina was came came into came into the video and um there was um a black guy that um smacked her butt cuz the song is a feminist song is pretty much talking about um sexual harassment and stuff like that and then um then the song goes on and then there's all these these urban black aesthetics and then um Lil Kim was there and the thing is Lil Kim wasn't in the video for long so it's so Jackson saw this as um um it's it's supposed to it's it's called a collaboration but Lil Kim's appearance is coming off as a cosign so a cosign to Christina Aguilera playing around with blackness to make this music so it's um it's uh it's it's interesting like looking back at it like it's and considering it was the 2000s a lot of things were normalized that shouldn't be normalized <laughs> and um what else did she say um it was a pretty much appropriation of the blues and rock and roll that she did and then and then she had her um i'm cool laid back i'm a free moment with um stripped and and apparently that's how you're supposed to feel when you're playing around with blackness you're supposed to feel free so she is like saying i'm okay i'm tired of the white i'm tired of the white world but hey but baby you're a white girl <laughs> um so that's um that's interesting and what's interesting um th what jackson pointed out is that christina um used to um go to pittsburgh with um, her grandmother to um get records from soul and blues numbers like billy holiday otis redding pearl bailey and stevie wonder so christina aguilera pretty much grew up with black music and um yeah so stripped was like I'm I'm trying to be hip for a moment, and um, and then that was pretty much the music. Like she made she got a lot of uh, money off of stripped. I think that was her best selling record, and um, and um, sh what else was going on? Yeah, she's talking about how Christina is pretty much the this different type of pop artist with the soulful voice because she's she's known for her voice, and um, it's um, it's staggering on what on how pretty much like how you you you're pretty much known to be this soulful artist and you're using music this way black music and you're pretty much conscious that this is an urban a black um culture that you're delving into especially with that music video and you're gonna benefit and profit off of it that's pretty that's cultural appropriation and um it's and you're trying to make a, a feminist um song out of it which none of this is speaking feminism like yeah there was that sexual harassment um mess message that was going on but what does it have to why does it have to be in the hood why does it have to be where messages of crack is whack and 
all of that stuff was going on. Like it was a it's a messy video looking back at it now. And um and during this era, she had like a lot of different hairstyles, a lot of black quote unquote um hairstyles. Um I think she had um I think she had cornrows and stuff like that. So is Mm, they try to they try to make her this is how she was marketable back back then like that was the thing that made things m money even though it was uh harmful and um exploitative of black music that's something that needs to be called out and yeah as you follow her career the next album is titled back to the basics so you you were stripped played around with black culture now you're going back to the basics and don't want to do black music no more <laughs> so that's cause that's like you have to understand how problematic that is like she like she was she went into like the hip-hop the urban the that that um segment of black music and now she's back to her soulful the jazz um if you saw the music video for ain't no other man it's kind of giving you josephine baker harlem um harlem renaissance feel to it and it's like oh so this is what you're doing <laughs> and um and that's pretty much how how the music industry it has so many things that need to be called out and needs to be critiqued and it needs to be held accountable for um and um I don't know if y'all know about the news about Jennifer Lopez and Ashanti um Ashanti was a known was pretty much a known backup vocalist for Jennifer Lopez's songs um a lot of them I think were um I'm real. Um, what else did Ashanti do? Like Ashant, like there was a lot of Ashanti songs that could have been Ashanti's, but then it ended up being Jennifer Lopez's songs. So, um, and I know in the I'm real, Jennifer Lopez said the N word, and um, that's pretty much going into more cultural appropriation callouts and. And Ja Rule is complicit because he pretty much, ha she, like, they had so many hits, um, Ashanti and Ja Rule. And then Jennifer Lopez and Ja Rule, they, they got even more bigger success with the collaborations that they had, like, Ain't It Funny and, no, and I'm Real. And it's pretty much talks, and it pretty much tells you about. Jennifer Lopez, even though she's not, uh, even though she's not black and she's Latinx, so you're not too white, apparently, not too black, but so you're marketable in that sense. And you know, Jennifer Lopez, um, she's a um, thin um, person, so desirability also plays into that. And, um, that's pretty much um, how Ashanti probably could have had a bigger career if Jennifer Lopez wasn't probably in the picture. But you know how the music industry plays and there's these industry plants too. So I I looked up industry plants and you'll be surprised. Like, like some people, music may not be their direction, even though they're probably good bops and stuff like that. But it came at the expense of a lot of people on how these people um came up. And um and it's like this joke where a lot of people were 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 saying were saying um um a Jennifer Lop talk about a Jennifer Lopez song and it's like Ashanti sung that. <laughs> like Jennifer Lopez never sung or something like that. So it's like this running joke that comes that is on um social media and stuff like that. So it's eh, it's um it's pretty interesting. Yeah, Jackson had this quote saying um 
um, rock capable of making a boat to black forms without smearing on the black face. So that's so it's like how pretty much how music has become a minstrel show. Like Jim, like how no, how notable Jim Crow was and blackface. Like you're you're putting on this performance of blackness, but you're not black. And um, it's um, pretty much contributes to um, the capitalist um, exploitation and oppression that black music artists were going through. And she pretty much also, she also said that white women were using primitive, quote unquote, primitiveness and exotic um, performances for their sexual maturity because of how black women were fetishized. Like it's this narrative that um, white men go, they have, there's these fetishes on black women and Asian women too about um, the, about a black woman's butt and stuff like that. Like there's this fetish that's going on and white women we're using those, um, using those black features, using those exotic, trying to have their exotic portrayal of blackness, to, to um, pretty much um, establish their sexual maturity, and you saw that with um, Christina and uh, Miley Cyrus, and um, mm, let me see what else is going on. I think, think that was, I think that was it. Yeah, on this paragraph, Jackson said, in many ways, more restrictive than politics, pop culture holds firm to the ideas that women can only be one thing, and America, like its women, white women, ch chased. While black girls are red grown before they hit puberty, white women must find creative ways to own that maturity for themselves. Much as those overheard white boys. Um, to turn men assume their racial desires would ultimately free them white pop stars native to the industry as little girls and young women need to go primitive to be sexual in ways whiteness doesn't afford they too need to be changed both impulses whether stop slack slaked by another individual or worn on the body like a costume inhabit colonial fantasies in a concrete search for a real primitive paradise and she was quoting bell hooks and ethnicity, in this case, blackness by way of hip hop culture becomes spice seasoning that can liven up the dull dish that is mainstream white culture. Where Britney dabbled, um, Christina devoured black styles, black genres, black sounds in order to get grown. She had plenty enough precedent, but also left a mark of her own, one emulated in the decade plus since. Yep. We got you, Christina. <laughs> and um, then she was um, talking about Miley Cyrus and how y'all y'all know Miley Cyrus. Um, it, it's when um, she got out of Hannah Montana and became the and became and got to her um, adult um, pe period, and that's when she was using things like twerking. Um, and then um, her ra the raunchiness and stuff like that um, during the MTV Video Music Awards when she was twerking on Robin Thicke. And um, she used a lot of hip hop. She used a lot of trap in um, that album that she did. I think it was Bangers. But um, yeah, and Jackson said they can experiment, get dirty, shock the public, seize their womanhood, and then after the fun is over, walk away like it never happened. Because Miley Cyrus now she 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 wasn't she's now she's not used she's not in that um that stage now where she was twerking and using hip hop for um sexuality purposes, and now she's. Now she's in a period that I think she's better suited for, which is like the Joan Jett rock, punk rock, and Steve and the Stevie Nicks and um that that type of music. But the fact that she did that in order to trying to establish her adulthood, that is um that is pretty um what's the word? 
grotesque, brutal, <laughs> because um, you're still a rich white woman at the end of the day, and black people are still getting killed. And um, and then I think um, she was going back into um, Christina. Christina, um, she was talking about her Back to Basics album, and then she went to... Um, what was the next album that she did? Um, yeah, I think Back to Basics and then Liberation, which is her newest album. It was that she did um, three years ago called Liberation. And that was most, it was mostly R&B. She was going back into the, her first album, the R&B that made Christina, Christina. And... She pretty much talked about the stripped era and it's like, eh, I don't feel like doing that anymore. Like I'm like, I was just having fun in my youth, but it's, it is like, you're having fun at the expense of black pain. So it was, it was like, she didn't really understand the damage that she was, that she was, um, that she, um, put on, um, on um, black culture. And I think that was it for that chapter. And then chapter two. Yeah, chapter two, the cover girl, blackness groundbreaking. Um, this one started off with um Kim Kardashian's 2014 paper magazine cover. And if if y'all don't if y'all remember that cover is where she was um looking from behind and she had this champagne glass and the champagne the champagne glass was on top of her butt and then the champ and then she was opening the champagne bottle and then there was the, the champagne splash all to back to, all back to the glass and if you notice the photo she was kind of her skin was pretty tan and um it was pretty much in reference to um a lot of black figures that the photographer, um, the photographer's name was, um, was this Mark Jacobs? No, it was, um, I forgot his name, but it was this photographer who did shoots like this, notably for, um, black figures like Grace Jones and, um, other, other black models. And, um, it was it was just funny how he's using that style now that oh now it's a non black um she's white she's armenian which people say you're not not exactly white but you're acceptable and you'll be marketable so th that's the controversy surrounding that magazine and um Pretty much talking about the Kardashians and how they're notable culture vultures. <laughs> Cause um like they did so much damage and they have black children. Like it's insane like how the Kardashian became the Kardashians became an empire, the Kardashians and the Jenners. So cause cause we'll get into the the Jenners too. Like cause um I think it was I don't know if it was both of them, Kylie and Kendall Jenner. Um, they were stealing fashion trends from black owned brands in hip hop fashion in hip hop fashion designs. And I think a lot of them, it was, it was one brand that was n notable for um, merchandise that had Biggie Smalls and Tupac. And I think it was Biggie, Biggie Smalls um, mother that said that they didn't have any of the royalties. They didn't have any um, consultation before they got on with these businesses. Um, it was it was a hot mess. <laughs> and um, Khloe Kardashian, there she she had she had. It was called boxer braids. <laughs> you y'all know that era where she was using um black hair and it was called um boxer braids. <laughs> and um what else? And um Kylie was using lip fillers. If y'all remember the lip fillers in which 
it was she she's known for like cosmetics and stuff like that and there was this challenge called the kylie jenner challenge and where people were putting up this put put these lip fillers in their mouth trying to make their lip bigger and a lot of people got hurt from that challenge so she was pretty much using a black feet notable black feature and um trying to um make her lips puffier and bigger and a lot of people make a challenge off of that trying to make some fun trying to make some cash off of, off of that and then um and then a lot of people got hurt it was like a playing into um black characteristics and black features and stuff like that and then talking about the black children like Kim got black children, Chloe got black children, Kylie got black children, and their brother Rob got a black child. So it's, they're known for their fetishization of blackness and black culture. And um, what is through their relationships, their businesses, their, their performances, and pretty much how they go on and on build, building their empire. So, um, and then it, because, because of the fashion industry, she was going more into, Jackson was going more into the fashion industry. Um, she said, um, while the fashion industry demands an ongoing bibliographic record of who did what, which way, weeding out counterfeits, naive assistance, the working class, and anything that might disturb the sanctified lineage of designer fashion, the industry also relies on the underclasses to breathe new life into the same tired old lines, patterns, and schema. In fashion, there is a fine, sometimes indistinguishable line separating inspiration and theft. So that's how she's pretty much telling you the honest truth about how the fashion industry works. Like uh, people get ideas off of each other, make make um, business off of that, gain a profit, and never compensate um, the person they that inspired them the idea. So that's pretty much how fashion capitalism works. And Jackson said the New York Times Catherine Rossman has written. Palau, who denied his work before any connection with Afro-diasporic tradition, had sampled from Black styles prior. He gave a cast of predominantly white models cornrows for Valentino's African Spring 2016 show. 2016. Um, immortalized by coverage in Vogue, designers Maria Grazia Churi and Pier pa Paolo Piccioli without irony, place themselves in the tradition of Pablo Picasso, whose predilection for the Africa of his own imagination secured his spot in the European avant-garde. Yeah, the message Piccioli told Vogue is tolerance and the beauty that comes out of cross-cultural ex expression. Less than a year later, Palau sent another set of mostly white models down the runway wearing Bantu knots for the house's pre-fall 2016 collection. Palau told the Huffington Post that the style came from 90s Bjork, a continuation of last season with that very girly punky vibe. It's kind of the same girl, but she's going to have a rave now. So it's, it's how fashion industries, they use um, black features and put them, put them on white models, making them become the face of them and make a trend out of it. Like black is cool now. Black makes us the money now but it's not with black people. That's pretty much the thing that's going on. And um, what's next? There was this person named Mark Jacobs that was using um, candy painted dreadlocks. Mm. And um, he wasn't even familiar with Rossifarian culture. No, he wasn't. And he just thinks this is something that's innovative and stuff like that, which we all know. We all know he's been stealing. <laughs> and um, and then um, if you, I don't know if y'all remember um, the Devil Wears Prada. There was a reference here um, Jackson made to um, Devil Wears Prada in which um, Meryl Streep's character was talking talking to um Anne Hathaway's character about what was it a blue um a blue um 
sweatshirt that she was wearing and Anne Hathaway didn't think too much about it. She was thinking this is just this is just a sweatshirt. And Merle Street's character gave Anne the read on, oh, you think it's blue? It's not blue. It's Tulian or something like that. Like you don't know the hard work that's put into um these clothes. And yeah, it's just a sweatshirt. <laughs> and um it's it's pretty much going into uh, it's a look into the fashion industry itself and to how exploitative it is to people that are in the working cl- that are in the working class, um, people that make these clothings and everything else. So, and I'm not really into um the fashion industry like that, but this. But Jackson made it a way into what I can understand, like, even, no, even, like, everywhere there's a people that want to play a game and trying to make a profit out of stuff in, in these industries, and the fashion industry is not exempt from that. You would think, like, people have their own ideas and stuff like that, but, like, no, people borrow ideas claiming that it's inspiration and homage to um, people and and sources that they get their ideas from and they say like i'm the genius i'm the face i'm i made these things the thing the way they are and it goes into the individualism that capitalism promotes um and it's not truly individualism you're not truly self-made um it's based on uh, it's based on other people other people's experiences other people's ideas and you just you just know how to turn it into an industry you just know how to turn it into um your kingdom and throne but you're not putting anyone else in the table with you other than yourself so it tells you how we need to divest from this me 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 culture this i did it if you work hard um you'll get something out of it like you deserve all the money in the world just for something that you did only you and um jackson um was talking about um how um how high fashion there's an increase the like urban clothes that are notably urban streetwear gold jewelry hoop earrings that you know um older black women be wearing um the fashion industry has gotten to a place where they they see those things as commodifiable and they and they increase the value in high in in those clothings and other brands and places where black people can't afford those black people used to afford those type of clothings but they can't afford them no anymore because of the value that high fashion puts on those those types of items so is your inspiration came from a source that's notably oppressed and you're making business off of it making a lot of money and you're charging the people that you're gar- you're getting your inspiration from and it's in the communities that you got it from so it's it's really evil if you really have to think about it and Jackson said, like it's bosom bud- buddy fashion, the beauty industry loves to source inspiration from the social bottom and hide the dark, queer hands responsible, while American beauty um, eternally reaches for so-called Eurocentric standards that refrain often misses the industry's penchant for change. Ever since beauty acquired economy, dollars, and commercial heft, the standard has zigged and zagged to suit the whims of art, of fashion, of politics. Tans are in until they're out. First, it's about the eyes, and then it's about the hips, about the lips. Cherub faces take center stage one moment. Next, it's an angular structure fine enough to slice bread. People who grew up ostracized for their hairiness now smirk at the ones who draw in a set of thick brows. These changes, of course, occur within the small field that presumes white people do everything better, even if it requires sun damage or surgery to get there. So in this one, she was she was pretty much um, referencing um, YouTube YouTubers that are notable beauty gurus like Nikki Tutorials um, and Wayne Goss. And um, 
And um, Nikki Tutorial is a makeup person who's talking about what a beat face looks like, and it has some black inspirations on it. But she gets, all, she's the one that gets the most followers, the most subscribers, and the most viewers for um, her takes. So it's pretty much talking about how the mainstream goes toward the ones that are white, even if, and the black features spice it up for them. And then um, Wayne Goss was talking about how Instagram, Wayne Goss has this video called Instagram is turning girls into drag queens. And I think they're, I think Wayne Goss is gay, but it talks, it's pretty much, um, it, it was it was pretty much anti trans masculine um, sentiments that were going on. So, and it was transphobic, like like t talking about how um, how uh, people portray themselves on Instagram and stuff like that, and it and um, saying like people that are that identify as women look like well, talking about cis women. And they look like trans women. So pretty much given this anti-trans um, sentiments as if trans women are ugly. And, um, and saying that Instagram is fabricated and stuff like that, which is, which is garbage, like needs to be called out. And it's very harmful that he got a lot of, a lot of viewers off of that, off of that um, video. So pretty much talk about how transphobia is um, praised and stuff like that. So, and um, talk about drag culture, which is notably black um, LGBTQ plus culture. So the drag queens that made the culture what it is, you're calling out your own, you're pretty much harming your own people, you're harming your quote unquote own people because black LGBTQ people there and white LGBTQ um people there are different battles going on there. And um let me see. I think I can go into part two. I think I have enough time for part two and then that'll be it. I'll probably do part three and part four in the next video. So um Part three is um, art and language. So chapter three is about art and chapter four is about language. And chapter three is titled The Artist, A Dead Boy Made Art. So this was a funny introduction into Rachel Dolezal because I didn't know um, the name she used to go by was Nkechi Amare Diallo, which is... a um, gives an Afrocentric name and um, talking about Rachel Dolezal's life and how she pretty much used blackness for her gain um, a, a self-prescribed transracial which doesn't exist um, she um, she um, is a notable artist um, and um, she made she did things with the NAACP. She was the president, I think, at one point. And um, she um, taught at one some of the HBCUs. I think she she either taught at Tougaloo or Howard University. I think well, she went to Howard, but I think she taught at Tougaloo. And she has this she has this memoir called In Full Color which you can say that's a reference to in living color. Um, it's pretty much her playing around with blackness. Like, you know, she like she's notable for the curly hair that she had, and she clearly tanned her skin trying to look like a black woman. And, and it's like, how did people not catch this? Like, how did people not catch on to um, this person? But, um, like, yeah, she probably lied to them and stuff like that, but, um, she's not a black, she's not a black woman. She's a white woman with curly and tan, curly hair and tan skin. And she used a lot of black art for her gain. And, um, pretty much talking about, and then she also talked about, um, racism in the art world. Um... And 
the 2014 Whit in the Whitney Museum of American Art during the 2014. She was talking about the portrait of Barack Obama by um, a photographer by a photographer how important it was for a black photographer to have a portrait of Barack Obama and um what else is going on there was this white artist that was going by the name Donnell Wolford and it was a name by a black woman <laughs> it was inspired by a name by a black woman and Donnell Wolford is not their name. It's um, it's like an alter ego. So they were playing around with a black name, and um, it was pretty much tell you how how metaphorically and literally the art world is known for cultural appropriation, literally all the time, um, like the fashion industry, but um, it's it's. It's supposed it's like gotten to a stage where like diversity and all of that are are used nowadays to um try to give the art world like something else to deal with, something else that's marketable and commodifiable. So like black experiences is like becoming the thing now. A lot of white artists are going are going into that knowing they have to pay respects and most likely shouldn't better earn or better off not deal doing these portraits and um and then this man named kenneth goldsmith um had a poem called um uh, kenneth goldsmith um has this poem about michael brown and the poem was pretty much a description of the his of Michael Brown's autopsy report when he got killed in Ferguson, Missouri, and it's like, why is this white person having this trauma sensation with this with this um with black death right now? So it's like it's pretty much paying in district like Kenneth Goldsmith probably thinks he's paying respect to uh, and tribute to Michael Brown, but it's literally like you're a white person that needs to know your place into um, these types of um, moments where it should be black people um, um, giving giving care to the the story that was going on with Michael Brown, like the violence that was going on and pretty much talking about white people and literature so how white people tell make the narratives when it comes to um black pain and black death like the it was it was controversial for harper lee to write to kill a mockingbird because it has this white savior um narrative with um atticus and atticus finch trying to save this trying to save this black man from a rape case which was it was a false rape case but the black man still was found guilty. And um, it's it's like centering, it's pretty much centering white people. Like there are good white people. Not all white people are racist. And, um, white people are just trying to live their lives and they have the good intentions. And racism is some, is a thing of the past too, which racism comes in many different different facets. Like like it's it's racism is what creates environmental injustice, climate crisis, poverty, food insecurity, education education injustice, um em- unemployment, anti-blackness is causing all these things to become the way they are. It's an operation and it's not just you thinking black people are inferior, but it's this whole system that puts black people in inferior um, um, sin- and experiences. And um, what else is going on? And this this one was was. Um, it's it was it upset me like someone made a VR a virtual reality of 
it's called Real Violence v- VR, but it's supposed is is making white people well, notably white people, but anyone can put on go into this virtual reality and try to understand what it's like to be brutalized by the police. So it's and that person made a lot of money out of it. And it's like, why? And then there's this artist named Dana Schutz who um painted um Emmett Till's um dead body. Um so if y'all know about the story of Emmett Till who was killed by by um some white men for um it was a false um allegation that there was some mistreatment towards a, a white woman like whispering or something and they killed him for it and and then um his mom had an open casket funeral and you see Emmett Till's face just so messed up. Like it's sick and it's it's sick to watch. And then this white woman, and this was ve- this was very recent. Tried to paint Emmett. It's called open casket. So Emmett Till's face. She literally drew his dead body, and it's it's like you really making a making money off of this like you didn't even discuss with um emmett till's um family you didn't like contact his estate or anything like like you're the only one that's pretty much benefiting from this you're you're trying to get the fame and the attention from this and it pretty much talks about the virality and the sensationalism that comes with black death because like I don't know about y'all, but it really I can't really watch another video of a black person get um get harmed by the state. Like that's something that's triggering for me right now because it's like we shouldn't be numb to these videos. We shouldn't be numb to black death and black pain. Like these are things that should not be happening. And um and um, that's pretty much what um, we're at a state now where care, well, we've always been in a society where care isn't isn't emphasized enough. Care isn't being taken seriously. And um, these types of things happen and it drives you mad and you want to do something you shouldn't be doing. And... <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. Jackson had this quote: um, "Only on the subject of race do we permit disregard for intellectual and artistic achievements and address today's problems with yesterday's remedies." Like we have to learn from history at this point how these things need to be taken with care, and they need to be. There's need to be some sensitivity to them, like. Like, why are we have? Why do we have a painting of Emmett Till's dead body when there's literally a photo approved by someone in Emmett Till's life? Like, there's literally a picture of Emmett Till. You can literally Google it. Why is there a painting of it? Why do we need to go this right now? And this in a museum where the public can see it is not in a room where that's approved by the Emmett Till's um, family where it's been taken with care and people don't can opt out of seeing it. Like people have to walk and see that in that, in um, that gala. And that's pretty much, yeah, it goes in pretty much goes into like how insensitive and how we lack care for black death even though Emmett Till died like is almost 70 years ago, like almost 70 years ago, and people are not taking his death with care. So it's it's upsetting. And now this is the last chapter I'm going through with today with this video. Um, it's titled um, it's chapter four, the hipster, the new white Negro. So um it starts off with um 
um, Jackson was going through like these most hated word lists and I think it was like from Times People and college uni colleges and universities. They also had these things called the most hated word lists or words that need to be banned. And um, a lot of them, you can tell like if it wasn't for... It's these words like bet, swag, um, cray cray, giving me life, which a lot of them are based off of black and black queer um cu cultures so it's and they literally it, literally if y'all saw how internet lingo goes around like black people and black lgbtq people gave y'all gave the language for stan twitter um what else um like memes wouldn't be the same. Like it get it gives a different flavor to how life used to be. Like it's literally people's diction and how they communicate. And these were like it shows you like we don't really we don't need these words for we don't need these most hated word lists. It can it can give room for xenophobia. It can give room for anti blackness. It can give room for anti queerness and anti anti trans sentiments and um they can be misogynistic so it's and no, like no one calls out on it and um Jackson was um referencing um Norman Whaler's 1957 essay titled The White Negro which pretty much um inspired the title of this book The White of White Negroes and let me let me get to the page. Oh, another one. Bye, Felicia. Like a lot of people were saying that's one of the most hated words. And um Yeah, she was pretty much going to tell what Norman Mailer um meant by white negro is like these white people that go into um black communities to get some get some work to get to benefit off of them get some research or something like that and jackson said in mailer's terms the hipster yearns to live dangerously so that he mailer uses ex exclusively masculine pronouns for his hipsters may rewire his instincts afford doled by the gray monotony of white american life Cultural theft is only the symptom, the readily identifiable mark of whiteness in crisis. The hipster yearns, as his parents never did, to reconcile his place in a violently modern society that could at any moment see him dead with the inheritance that would see him at the helm of the same violent society of all goes to plan. The hipster seeks out the Negro because from who better to learn the trans transitive properties of living than a community who could never take life for granted. So pretty much talking about it's a critique of the hipster movements, the the hippies and all that stuff, especially during the countercultural movement in which these white hipsters they interact with black black people to um get a a font to have a fondness of life which being black is not fun all the time. Sometimes it's very dangerous. It's it's cool though, but it can be very dangerous. <laughs> um, it's pretty much tapped into like pretty much giving pretty much giving you a a description of what cultural appropriation um is pretty much phased and is pretty much pretty much um said and um you see that with um how the fashion industry moves how the art industry moves how the music industry moves and how people um um try to modify their bodies to um to um resemble and um and and I think that was, was that it? No, that's not it. Yeah, just one last thing. Yeah, after um, Jackson was talking about 
talking about um, hipsters. She was talking about hip hop and how hip hop is now like the most streamed, the most um, played music right now. It used to be like rock or something, but now hip hop is where black people are, is primarily black people um, taking over that music. But um, just because something like that happens doesn't mean like we're getting anywhere because of like how white people um fetishize blackness like jackson um recalled a moment when um kendrick lamar was having a concert and he had an audience member come up and um and he had her try to rap one of his songs and she said the n-word it's a white white girl and he had her off and it's like think about how many white people are probably in having house parties playing hip hop, probably saying the N word like it's a chorus, like it I'm probably in sync and stuff like that. So it's telling you how how hip hop is like at a it's 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 like something needs to be done. There needs to be an intervention to white people about the usage of the n-word and how there's a historical there's a historical attachment with black people in that word and they shouldn't have a right to say it and that and it's like that's pretty much cultural appropriation in the um in the surface level but it also looks like a white person trying on something from a black designer, but probably say like a white fashion mogul probably has probably bought something from a black designer, loves the outfit and everything, but pay their black workers a, a wage that's unlivable. And that's pretty much talks about the po- how cultural appropriation is tied to power and that power is used to suppress and oppress um people that are in that are in um lower positions and um yeah yeah um jackson um said black speech cannot soothe the broken white soul only revolution can do that so um yeah that was pretty much it for part one and two so the next video will be about part three and part four so um thank y'all um stay tuned for that um follow my reading list at raisin souls um and my personal instagram at intellectual albert it'll be on the description box below and we'll get into more white negroes soon All right, so stay tuned for the next video. See ya.